One of the most important things that a person can do is to learn how to handle God's Word rightly. And a good example of this is found in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. So with that said, open up your Bibles and look once more to the book of Revelation and chapter 4. Now, let me simply state to you that Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 has an important theological uh, theme attached to it. And what is that theme? Well, we can call it our blessed hope. Why do I say that? Because Paul calls it our blessed hope. And of course, I'm speaking about the term rapture. Now, the biblical word that is usually thought of when we use the term rapture is just the word to be snatched away or taken away. And many good intending biblical scholars, they place the rapture in this chapter we're looking at now, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. And let me simply state to you that there's a great danger with doing so. What is that? Well, one of the wisest things that we can invest in is what's known as hermeneutics, which is theories of biblical interpretation. That is how to rightly interpret Scripture. And when we violate hermeneutics, when we don't follow the rules and the laws for interpreting Scripture, what does that do? Well, when we do so, it gives other people the right to look at other scriptures and apply that same faulty methodology to it. What I'm talking about? Well, look, if you would, to verse 1. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, and after these things. Now, I would suggest to you that although chapters 2 and 3, we speak about seven congregation, that is, believing congregations, I would suggest to you that with the end of Revelation chapter 3, God is not finished talking to His people. That is, His congregation of the redeemed, followers of Messiah Yeshua. I would say that in chapters 2 and 3, He speaks about seven congregations to impart holiness into the body of believers and also to speak to us concerning the sanctifying call that we have in our life. That is, that God has given us a purpose. And what is that purpose? Well, to be faithful in all seasons. And in Revelation chapter 4, that what we see is this that John is going up into the heavens to see things from God's perspective. We're going to see that John is given a vision the rest of this book. In no way does it say in Revelation chapter 4 that, that God is calling the believers up. Therefore, the rapture takes place here. Now, without uh, going into further detail of my own, let's just look at the verse. It says, And it came about after these things, I looked, who's speaking? John. And behold, a door was opened up in the heavens. Now, opening up usually has to do with revealing. It is like uh, being invited to cast your eyes inward. And that's what's happening here. So John is receiving an invitation to come up into the heavens. Is this invitation to all the body of Messiah? No, it's not. It is uniquely to John, and it's dangerous if we apply this text beyond that. It says as well in verse 1, And the first voice which I heard, the voice as a trumpet. Now, in Hebrew, there's two words for trumpet. One is that shofar. That shofar is that ram's horn. And in a unique way, and we've spoken of this, it speaks about God's provision, what God has provided for salvation. But there's also a second type of trumpet mentioned in the Old Covenant in the Hebrew Bible. And those are our the trumpets, the silver trumpets. And they were used more often than not to announce something, to, to reveal what is about to take place. And I would suggest to you that here in Revelation chapter 4, the, the trumpet that John heard was for the purpose of announcing, for the purpose of revealing what was going to take place. We read, 
It is the first sound which I heard as the, the trumpet, the voice of the trumpet that was speaking to me. And it says, who's being addressed? Just John. This, this trumpet sound calls him up and says, behold, I will show you what is going to take place afterwards. Meaning what? After this, this age, leading up to the last days. So it's speaking here about a transition. Many scholars point out that John is being called up into the heaven during this transition. For what purpose? A new perspective. What Revelation chapter 4 is doing is giving us a heavenly perspective to interpret what's going to happen in the last days. And once again, I want to share with you where we're going beginning in Revelation chapter 4 as we press through all of this book is so vital in us understanding what God's up to, what He's calling us to display, how we can position ourselves in faithfulness and demonstrate our kingdom commitment. And that's important. In the last days, God is calling His people to demonstrate their commitment to Him, and their, their confidence in God's great promise of the establishment of the kingdom of God. Well, look again, verse, verse 2. He says, In a moment I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne appeared in the heavens. Now, let me point out to you that in this fourth chapter, the word throne is going to appear approximately 12 times. There are some references even beyond that, but, but minimally there's 12 references to the throne. Now, what we need to glean about this entire book, we've spoken of this earlier. If we are going to summarize the purpose of the book of Revelation, if we're going to say what is the primary message of the book of Revelation, this is how John would answer it. It speaks about what must take place for the throne of God, which is in the heavens, for the throne of God in the heavens to come and be established on earth in the holy city of Jerusalem. Because when that throne comes to earth, that is synonymous with the, the inauguration of the kingdom of God. So that's what this book is about, the establishment of the kingdom of God. Now, let me point out something. Here, clearly, first thing John sees when he goes up into heaven and he's in the Spirit, seeing things from God's perspective, he sees the throne of God. Where is it? In the heavens. And this should tell us something. It should tell us that we ought not expect justice in this age. It's only when the throne of God comes and is established in this world, then the outcome of that is going to be a godly judgment. Up until that time, we can expect injustice, unrighteousness. And the only force for justice and righteousness are you and me. That we might display that character and that we might do what we talked about in our study of the book of Zechariah. That we might be people that execute justice. That we might be a force for righteousness in this world. Well, verse 2, once more. And in a moment I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne appeared in the heavens, and one who sat upon the throne. Now, this expression is going to be repeated over and over in this book of Revelation. The one who sits upon the throne. Now, in one sense, this is God the Father. And a unique thing that we're going to see as we begin today in this lesson, we're going to see that Messiah is, is spoken of near the throne, on the right of the throne. And then later on, we're going to see that he's going to be in the midst of the throne. And then it's going to say that he's the one that's on the throne. Now, why is that so important? Because it's speaking about a transition. Why is that so vital? Well, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, one of the main things that Daniel wants to reveal in that chapter is that all the glory and honor and authority and power that belongs rightly to God the Father 
it is going to be inherited by God the Son, that is Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. And we're seeing the beginning of that change, that transition, right here in Revelation chapter 4. So we speak about the one who sits upon the throne, verse 3. And the one who set his appearance was the appearance of jasper, which is a green stone, and then it uses another type of stone. And different translations will give different uh, names for the stone, but this is what we know about it. We know that it's a red stone. And once again, the biblical scholars point out that there's two images that's very important. The first one is green, and the second one is red. And green, biblically speaking, synonymous with, with life. And, and red is synonymous with the means of life, that is redemption or the shedding of blood. So we see this connection with, with God being revealed and his purpose to give life by means of redemption. And there was also a rainbow around the throne, and it had the appearance of a precious stone. Usually it's thought of as an emerald, verse 4. And around the throne, and here again, the word that keeps appearing over and over, when John is taken up into the heavens, everything that he sees in this fourth chapter, it's all about the throne the rule of God. He is coming to understand not only the throne of God, but the character of God's rule that is going to be coming into this world. And his task, his call, is to share this message so that those who are wise, those who are humble, those who are willing to trust in God, that they might also go through a transition where they are made ready for the kingdom. Verse 4, and around the throne were these 24 thrones. And, and upon the thrones I, I saw 24 elders sitting, and they were clothed in white garments. So white is synonymous here with purity. And this is an outcome of redemption. So they were clothed in white garments, and notice what they had. They had crowns of gold upon their heads. So purity and authority in this passage are working together. And that's just one of the characters of God. It's when we walk in purity, in integrity, reflecting the kingdom character that God is going to give us authority to be used by him for his purposes. And then notice something else. We also find in this same passage of Scripture, in the next verse, verse 5, and from, from the throne went forth lightnings and thundering and, and sounds. Now, this is important because these three things are seen in the book of Exodus. Where are they seen in the book of Exodus? At Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai, most of us don't understand what took place that first time 50 days after Passover when God brought the children of Israel to Mount Sinai. When, when, when Moses was told to prepare the people because in three days, remember three, having to do with revelation revealing something. And what was God going to reveal? Well, he spoke. This is not in, revel in Exodus chapter 20. This is not about the giving of the, the law and those tablets. That's later on in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 20, where these uh, lightnings and thundering and the various sounds that were, what it says in Exodus, were seen. Very interesting. Sounds, not that they were heard, but they were seen. And what takes place? Well, here's the key. In the end of that 20th chapter, after God speaks, the Ten Commandments, we read that God begins to move towards the people. And the people, they panicked because they weren't prepared. That's a long story that we could go into, but the point I want to see is that God was moving towards the people, and they failed that day. The same imagery is repeated here because what's the book of Revelation about? 
God bringing his rule, his throne, his presence into this world and ruling forever and ever. And the question is this, are the congregation of redeemed, are we going to be prepared? Are we going to be ready or are we going to fail like Israel did those 3,500 years ago? Well, verse, verse 5 in the second half, not only were there these, these lightnings and thunders and sounds, it says also, and the seven torches of fire were burning, where? Shouldn't surprise us, before the throne. And it's also that they were the seven spirits of God. Now, seven has to do with the concept of holiness or perfection or sanctifying. And what it says here is that God's seven spirits, that is his Holy Spirit, is going to be going into this world and bringing about a change. It is going to be the key. I'm speaking about God's truth, God's anointing, his power that's going to be manifested through the Holy Spirit. All of this is going to be what's bringing about this transition from this age to the age to come or the kingdom of God. Verse 6, and before where? And before the throne was a sea like glass. It had the appearance of, of ice. And, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures that had eyes before them and after them. Now, here again, it's interesting because in the book of Revelation, we're going to see over and over, there's this emphasis on these four living creatures. They have a very important role that we'll talk about in a moment. But once again, the number four has to do with the world. We're going to see later on in this same study of the book of Revelation, we're going to see how the number four appears over and over like the four corners of the earth, the four winds of the heaven. And it's simply a reference to the four directions, north, south, east, and west. So when the number four appears in the scripture, it's talking about the world. And why is this the case? Well, because God is going to bring about this transition in all of the world. And notice these four creatures. It says that they had eyes all over them in front and behind. And eyes has to do with intelligence or knowledge, knowing everything. So God is going to bring this transition about with perfect knowledge, knowing everything. Nothing is going to escape his, his knowledge. And notice what else it says about these four, four beasts or creatures. They had the, the appearance of of the first beast was that of a lion. The second one was of an ox. The third one had the face of a man. And the fourth one was flying like an eagle. Now, here again, if we are someone who are students of prophecy, these animals uh, aren't new to us. Their, their significance is seen elsewhere in the prophets. And when a lion is mentioned, it speaks about glory. When an ox is mentioned, it speaks about power. When a man, the face of a man, it speaks about intelligence or wisdom. And then when something flies as an eagle, it speaks about that which is supernatural. So in this passage of scripture, what is being relayed around the throne of God, these four creatures, is some very important characteristics of God, that he is majestic, that he is glorious, that he is powerful, that he is all-knowing. And then finally, it is supernatural. That is his character. His ability is without any limitations. So what John is seeing is this. Not only does God have a plan, but God's plan is glorious. He has the power to bring it about. He knows all things. And there is a supernatural quality concerning it. So this transition is going to touch every aspect, every character of, of one's being. And then look, if you would, to verse, verse 8. And, and every one of these four uh, uh, creatures, they had six wings. Now, why is that important? Well, here again, I've shared with you how 
what John does. John is famous for taking Old Testament passages, things that were well known to the Jewish community, and borrowing them or altering them so that we might understand his, his revelation to us better. And these creatures, well, they also are alluded to as seraphim. These are not seraphim necessarily, but they're alluded to when we have a discussion in the book of Isaiah in chapter 7 of the seraphim. And the seraphim were these angels, and they also had six wings. Why is that important? Six is the number of grace. And what it's trying to reveal to us is this. All these things are only going to become a reality when, when grace is the foundation of your life and my life. So once again, verse, verse 8. And every one of these four uh, uh, creatures, they had six wings, and around them and before them, they had uh, uh, eyes. They were full of eyes. And there was what? And they were not silent at all. For day and night they did something. They said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, what's important for us to see is this. It's clear reference now to what I've alluded to in the book of Isaiah. Because in Isaiah, those seraphim say, Kadosh, 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 Hashem Savot, Meloko Haaretz Kavodo, which means, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of His glory. But here, there's a change. He begins in that way. Notice again, these creatures say, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of the God of hosts. And then he says, who was and is and is what? Coming. So he changes that little ending to something different. Why is that? It answers how is all of God's world, all of his creation going to become holy? And the answer to that is by the fact that he's coming. And how is he coming? Who's bringing that throne? Messiah Yeshua. Now, why is that so important that we see this? Well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Because when we get into chapter 5 next week, we're going to see that everything focuses now. There's a shift from the one who sits upon the throne to the one who is going to bring it about. This one who is holy, 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 who was and is, remember, there was never a time that Messiah did not exist. And what does it say about him? that he is coming. He will come, and what's he going to do? Just what we talked about. His task is to bring that throne from the heavens and set it up in the holy city of Jerusalem and establish the kingdom of God. Verse 9, and, and to each of these, it says that these creatures, they gave glory and honor and thanksgiving to who? The one who set where? Shouldn't surprise us, upon the throne. And furthermore, it says that this one lives forever and ever. And when this proclamation was made, notice what takes place. Now, elders are important because elders are elders because they, they were given that position because of a testimony. They demonstrated how the people should respond. And this is what we're seeing here. Because when they witnessed that, when they heard this, verse 10, they fell, who did? The 24 elders upon their faces before the one who sits well, who sits upon the throne. And they worship the one who lives forever and ever. And here's the last thing I want you to see. Remember what it says earlier about them? These elders that had uh, crowns, they had white garments. And to each of them were given crowns that were set upon their head. And notice what they did. See, these crowns were the outcome of good deeds. That is having a response, a proper response to the things of God. And, and what did they do with these crowns? They were for their pride. No, they were not. They were for their wealth. No, they were not. What did they do? Keep reading. It says here that they, they went and they did something. It says, first of all, they spoke to, to the Lord saying, to you are worthy, our Lord, to take honor and, and glory and power. 
For you have created all things, and it says finally, and all things according to your will, it says they were made. So these crowns that they had, it says at the end of the previous verse, they laid them where? Well, don't miss it. It says, and they set them before the throne. Doing so, how? Worshiping God. So let me ask you a question as we begin to wrap up. What is it that you have to offer God? If you were invited before his throne, what would you have to lay before that? Do you have a testimony? Do you have a history of walking with God, of, of being wise enough to do his will and, and, and purchasing through right living these crowns? that you might have something to offer him, that you might have a testimony that shares before others that God was, was first in your life. Notice how they referred to God. They didn't say, you know, God or Savior. They called him Lord, our Lord. And the question that we have to answer is this. By our behavior, do people see that he's the Lord of our life? Well, we'll close with that until next week.